And the church said, I welcome everyone tonight in Jesus' name. I pray that the Lord will enlighten us on the important subject of tonight and it help us to enlighten other people on this important subject in Jesus' name. And the Lord will hold you up. Amen. And you will stand firm in your conviction in Jesus' name. Let's pray together. Father, we bless your name for tonight again. Thank you for your people. Thank you for our leaders, our pastors, our overseers. Thank you for the faithfulness you've given everyone, all our workers and everyone here, and those who are still on their way. We're asking, oh Lord, enrich our knowledge tonight in Jesus' name. Open our eyes of understanding. Help us, Lord, to stand and to stand firm, never compromising with the devil or with the world or with the flesh in Jesus' name. Give us more of your grace, more of your power, more of your strength, and more of the boldness to confront whatever may challenge our faith in Jesus' name. You've raised us up to earnestly contend for the faith. Once delivered unto the saints, nothing will weaken us. Nothing will make us fail. Nothing will make us fall. Thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. We're looking at James chapter 1 tonight. James chapter 1 verse 2. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations. There are two words there we do not normally connect. The word joy, all joy, and then the word temptations. How can I be happy? How can I be joyful? How can I be excited when I'm confronted with temptation? Actually, the word temptation has two perspectives. From the side of God, it means testing, testing, trial. It's just testing our confidence in Him. It's testing our commitment to Him. It's testing our consecration unto Him. And He wants to prove, He wants to prove to the devil, He wants to prove to the world, that's my child, that's my son, that's my servant. He said, Satan, watch and see. This is testing. Look at Job. He will not compromise. He will not sin. Ah, Satan said, you try him. You test him. And you will see that the material is made of is not as solid as you thought. And God said, go lay your hands on him. Temptation from the side of God, it was to prove that Job was a righteous man. He wanted to prove his redemption. And so it's like going to the exam hall. If you are prepared, you're happy. Examination is coming. And the teacher is going to discover that I have knowledge. I have studied. The teacher is going to discover I'm a special class by myself. And so I'm happy as we're going to the exam hall. On the side of Satan, he takes that same event and he says, do you think you are a child of God? Okay, if thou be the son of God, turn these stones into bread. After all, you're hungry. And God fed his own people in Egypt who came from Egypt. All those 40 years, he fed them. And he just said, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Okay, if he's well pleased in you, here you are, you're hungry. He's well pleased in you. The Holy Spirit led you into the wilderness to be tempted by me. If he's well pleased in you, all right, now that you're hungry, turn these stones to be bread. 
It came as a test to show that Jesus will not compromise. And from the side of God, it was to prove to the devil, that's my son, he will not obey you. And then Satan would have rejoiced if Jesus had yielded to that temptation, which is the enticement, the same thing, the same thing, you know, enticement of the devil to make him fall and rebel against his father. And so the word temptation there has the connotation of trial, of testing, which is all right. It also has the connotation of enticement to be lured into evil and to be drawn into evil. Look at verse 12. Blessed is the man that endures temptation. You see the word there, endures. As you come to verse 2, it says, My brethren, come to it all joy when ye fall into diverse temptation. It's not talking of falling down. It's not talking of falling be below a heavy weight. It's saying when you are encountered with trials, when you are encountered with testings, which Satan wants to turn into enticement to do evil. Verse 12, blessed is the man that endures temptation. For when he is tried, you see that? Trial. When he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to them that love him. Look at verse 14. But every man is tempted. He's talking about another thing now. It's another side, another perspective. Every man is tempted when he's drawn away. He's been standing here. He's been standing with God. He's been standing on the word of God. But there's something inside him that the devil wants to use. It's like a magnet inside. And then there's a bigger magnet outside. And the outside magnet, an event, a material scene, a human being, a sinner, a devilish person, that magnet outside, wants to draw him or the magnet inside. And it says he's drawn away of his own lost and, uh, what's the word there? Enticed. This one is civil. It says, then when lost as conceived, it bringeth forth sin. And sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. Many times when people think about temptation, they're limited in their understanding. And the limitation in our understanding makes us not to do well. Verse 2, my brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations, different kinds of temptations. Put it this way. A man is confronted with diverse enemies, different kinds of enemies, and different kinds of enemies from different directions. But the man only recognizes one enemy and is fighting against that one single solitary enemy. And all the other things that are, all the other people that are enemies, he does not recognize them as enemies. Diverse temptation, diverse enemies, diverse challenges. He only recognizes one and is fighting only one enemy. He will not be on his guard against the others and so defeat will be unavoidable. That's the reason why we need to have understanding of what temptations are. And we need to have understanding in the diverse temptations. We have to have understanding of the different kinds of temptation. I'm sure you understand there are many deep and live leaders, many deep and live pastors, many deep and live people. They recognize the temptation of a man going to a woman and messing up his life. They say he has sinned. He yielded to temptation. 
And when you look at uh, some leaders that discipline, uh, you know, those they think have gone astray. The discipline is always only on immorality or fornication, adultery. He has sinned. He yielded to temptation. A lot of other things that are temptations that people yield to, we don't recognize, we don't understand. We don't understand there are diverse temptations. Look at Adam. Adam did not see any temptation in the presenting of the forbidden fruit. That was a great temptation. When he presented the forbidden fruit to each great temptation that plunged the whole world into sin. You think about Abraham. Abraham did not recognize Sarah's offer of Hagar as a temptation. The Lord has prevented me from having a child. And here is Hagar. This is my consent. This is my will. I give her to you. And it is, I will not mind at all to have children through her. Abraham did not see that a temptation. But you understand, the product of yielding to that temptation, you understand, Ishmael came. And the descendants of Ishmael came until today. There is still this conflict between the line of Isaac and the line of Ishmael. Because Abraham did not recognize Agar as temptation. And then when God said, let that woman go and her son. Abraham did not see it as temptation to pray. The prayer he prayed for Ishmael, let Ishmael live. And then let all the descendants of the promises you have given me fulfill it on Ishmael. Abraham did not see that prayer as a great temptation. That prayer was answered. Twelve nations will come out of that man. Well, you know the rest of the story. Do you remember Aaron? Aaron did not see it as temptation. He didn't perceive any temptation at all of make us a God. This is not adultery. This is not fornication. He's the high priest and was keeping himself away from women. But now make us a God. That's why God said, Moses, go back to your people. I rejected them. I disinherited them because they have turned away from following me. The spies, ten spies, did not see it as temptation, were sent to the land to go and examine how the land is. And as we are coming back, what do you think? What do you think? They didn't think it was temptation to speak out their mind. They said, I'm just speaking out my mind. It was a temptation they didn't resist because of speaking out their mind. You know what followed? Israel remained in the wilderness for the next 38 years, 40 years or together eventually. Achan did not think of any life-threatening danger. In the appeal of the goodly Babylonish garment, we've uh, gone to the battlefield and we've won the war. Here is a goodly Babylonish garment. Here is a wedge of gold. The owners have died. Nobody is going to make use of this. If we just leave it there, it will rot. And, every, and it will be a waste. And this was created by God. Mm, let me help myself. He did not think it was a great temptation. You see, there are people, because we did not see this as temptation, that as temptation, that's why many people yield. And they don't think anything has happened. You remember Ezekiah? Ezekiah was a good king. Ezekiah was the one that Isaiah told, set your house in order, because you will die, you will not live. And he cried to God and he said, God, I will not die. Don't you remember my life? I lived a perfect life. And God gave him how many years extra? 15 years. And then friends from afar. 
the Babylonians, they heard he had been healed. They heard of the miracle and they came to rejoice with him. He didn't see any temptation at all because now he conducted them. He said, thank you for coming. You know, God healed me and it was a great sin and now I'm alive and for the next 15 years I'm going to keep on in the kingdom come 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 and see my kingdom and come and see the beauty the glory of my kingdom he didn't see it was a temptation and after they've gone Isaiah came and said tell me what have they seen in your house he said I showed them everything your people, the whole nation, because of that yielding to that temptation, they will go into Babylon for 70 years. Joshua was not conscious of any temptation. As he was already, he was on top of the situation. We've conquered that, we've conquered that, we've conquered that. And the Gibeonites now came. And the Gibeonites came in a pretended humility. And he said, we have come to surrender ourselves and to make a league, a connection agreement with you. And look at the food we got, the bread we brought from our place, already is moldy. And look at our garments that we wore when we were coming from a far country, it's already worn out. He didn't see any temptation in this at all. And so he made the agreement with them. And then three days after, he saw that they came from that place that was very near. But he had yielded already. I'm telling you this so that you understand. Temptation, temptation, temptation. It's not only that, you know, I praise the Lord. Some people will say, you know, from the beginning of this year until now, I have never been tempted at all. You know what they're thinking about? They're thinking of that only one temptation. I've not been attracted to any other person except my wife. I've not uh, touched anybody except, uh, you know, my husband. It's so limited. We're talking about diverse temptations. The Lord gave us understanding. Not recognizing diverse temptations, that is, not recognizing the diversity of temptations makes a deadly trap look like a neutral toy, makes a deadly trap look like even a desirable treasure. But Jesus said, watch and pray that she enter not into temptation. You see, Peter was so limited. He was thinking of me yielding to temptation. God forbid. Since when? Since when have I listened to the devil? Since when have I yielded to any temptation? Watch and pray that you do not enter into any temptation. He wasn't warning them of women, of wealth, of worldliness. He wasn't warning them of men, money, or even anything you'll call materialism. He wasn't warning them of girls, gold, or glory. Beware and watch against temptation. God will give us the victory. I will have the victory. I'm talking tonight on faith and faithfulness for triumph over temptations faith and faithfulness for triumph over temptation three things we're looking at number one the perception and process of temptation and testings the perception and process of temptations and testings number two the power and the pool of lusts in temptation the power and the pool of lusts in temptation the lust that abides in a man the inordinate affection that abides in a person inordinate affection for a material thing inordinate affection for even success inordinate affection for reaching a goal inordinate affection for achievement that we place beyond the word and the will of God that lost in the heart will then become the pool and the power by which Satan draws people into temptation the power and the pool of lusts in temptation point number three the pursuit and preservation 
of our treasure despite temptations. The pursuit and the preservation of our treasure. There are some individuals that recognize they have a treasure and they will protect that treasure with their very life and with their very blood and they say this peculiar treasure of mine that God has given to me nothing will take it away from me and to preserve that temptation become to shift temptation become to look the other direction temptation become to be weakened temptation become to compromise they say uh-uh I know you devil, I know what you're trying to do. You're trying to get me away from my treasure and get my treasure away from me. I will preserve this one with the last drop of my blood. Those are the people that have the victory. You will have the victory. Number one, the perception and process of temptation and testing. We're looking at James chapter 1. And I'm reading from verse 13. Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. This is the other side of temptation now. Allurements of Satan. Enticement to do evil. The pulling away to any corruption. Let no man say when he is enticed, a Lord. And drawn away to evil that I'm tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil. Neither tempted he any man. He does not tempt sinners. He does not tempt saints. He does not tempt anyone. But every man is tempted. Look at the process now. When he is drawn away of his own lust. You cannot say, Satan made me do it. Drawn away of his own lust. You cannot say, he was the one that put pressure on me. I had no hand in this. I would never have done this. I've never have gone there. He influenced me. Every man is tempted when he's drawn away of his own lust, it was a situation. I'm innocent. It was a circumstance. I'm innocent. You know, this community is so bad and corrupt and dirty that nobody can live in this community and remain clean. It's the community that did it on me. He said, he's drawn away of his own lust and enticed. If you are not interested in that, you will not go into it. You see fire burning. You don't, uh, you know, go into that. Nobody draws you into that. You see a house collapsing. You don't run there and say, somebody made me do it. And you see the ocean. You don't jump in. Somebody made me do it. It's something that is inside that draws the man. Verse 15, when lost as conceived, it bringeth forth sin. When lost as conceived, there's no conception without your consent. There's no conception without your personal active participation. And it is when lost within as conceived that they bring it for sin. And when sin is finished, when it is performed, when it is finalized, when it is put to action, bring it forth death. Look at Genesis chapter 6, reading from verse 5. This is what happens. This is how temptation takes root. This is how temptation draws people away and draws them away to sin, to perdition. It's something on the inside. When you are saved, that thing on the inside is weakened. It's giving a deadly blow. When you are sanctified, that thing on the inside is destroyed. That the body of sin 
might be destroyed. And so the temptation then would only be coming from outside and there is nothing really inside to draw you and to drive you into that thing. It's within the heart. Genesis chapter 6 verse 5 And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth. Why? How did their wickedness become so great? It says, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. It's the heart. It's the heart. The lost in the heart. The imagination in the heart. The daydreaming in the heart. The desire, wrong desire in the heart. The inordinate affection in the heart that has been thinking about it and thinking about it and planning for it. What did Jesus say in the New Testament? In Mark, in Mark chapter 7. Mark chapter 7. The perception and the process of temptation and testings. In Mark chapter 7, verse 20, here the Lord Jesus Christ said, and he said, that which cometh out of the man, that defiles the man. It is not so much as what is outside. It is not so much as how terrible the devil is, how dirty the world is, it is not so much as how the pressure was so great, but what comes out of man? For from within, out of the heart of men, proceed. You see this? That's what brings the temptation. What's in the heart? The heart already is dirty. The heart is defiled. The heart is desirous of seeing something, knowing something. The heart is inquisitive. I want to see how that tastes. I want to see how that feels. I want to see what pleasure is in that. I want to see what I can derive out of that. It is coming from the heart, for from within, out of the heart of men proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lasciviousness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within. We need to understand that if there were no defilement, no evil, no propensities or to evil in the heart, if the depravity were not in the heart, if the heart was pure, innocent, good, heavenly, the temptation would mean nothing. Because it's out of the heart, all these evil things come and they defile the man. Joshua chapter 7, Joshua chapter 7, Verse 21, Joshua was asking uh, Achan, tell me, how did this happen? How did you take that? Why did you go to hide it inside your tent? It says, this is the process. Joshua chapter 7, verse 21, when I saw among the spoils a goodly Babylonish garment, the word goodly was Achan's language, Achan's vocabulary. Something is beautiful, that's your language. Something is goodly, that's your language. Something is pleasant, that's your language. Have you noticed what looks goodly to one man, Achan, looks ungodly? To another person, depends on your eyes, depends on your mindset, depends on what you're looking at. You look at something, you say, this is good. Another person looks at that same thing 
and it says this is bad when I saw he saw among the spoils a goodly Babylonish garment and 200 shekels of silver and a wedge of gold of 50 shekels weight then I coveted that's the next term I looked at it seen it once no problem you have a journey go your way you have a goal fix your eyes on your goal you have a desire and a perception look at your desire but you know Achan he saw and kept on looking and kept on looking and kept on looking until there was something on the inside this will look good on me this will be this will make me rich and it began now to calculate I coveted them number one I saw he didn't see with another person's eyes he didn't see with the eyes of Joshua if he had seen that thing with the eyes of Joshua he would not have desired that thing but he saw it with his own defiled corrupted negatively influenced eyes he saw and then he converted them and he took them i took them and behold they are hid in the earth in the midst of my tent and the silver under it the process i saw i coveted i took we're looking at Isaiah chapter 44, verse 20. Isaiah chapter 44, reading from verse 20. In verse 20, it says, He feedeth on ashes. He feedeth on ashes. There's no nutrient. There's no nutritional value in the ashes, but he looks at it. At the beginning, it was like ashes, worthless, tasteless. This will not give anybody any pleasure, unnecessary, unnatural. But he kept on looking and looking and looking until the undesirable became desired and now he puts out his hand and he takes the ashes nothing has changed no nutrients there and it's not tasty at all it's tasteless but he feeds on ashes when you were young did anybody make you to drink alcohol just to taste it and it was bitter and you threw it away but there are people they taste it for the first time and they taste it again and they taste it again the thing has not changed the bitterness is still there but it's not bitter anymore it does not drive them away anymore it's like i need this one that's what happens when you see something for the first time that you have never seen you don't even know that you need that thing and it wasn't important to you but you keep on looking and keep on looking and keep on reading about it and keep on searching about it and keep on going to places you will see that thing then it becomes desirable then you begin to feed on ashes a deceived heart has turned him aside a deceived heart has turned him aside that he cannot deliver his soul nor say is there not a lie in my right hand something undesirable something bitter something that is going to bring damnation and condemnation if people keep on looking and keep on looking and keep on looking i'll try it i'll try it and they keep on trying eventually it becomes something they cannot even do without temptation micah 
chapter 2. I'm reading from verse 1. Micah chapter 2. Reading from verse 1. What to them that devise iniquity and work evil upon their beds. They're not sleeping, but they're lying down. And while they are there alone all by themselves, this person cannot say, somebody made me do this. He was alone by himself. And then he was working out the evil upon his bed. He was calculating, how can I get this? How can I have this? How can I possess this? How can this be mine? While others are sleeping, is calculating and strategizing. And when morning is light, they practiced it. They proposed it in the night. And now in the morning, they practice it because it is in the power of their hands. They see the method of how to get it, how to gain it. And they covet fields and take them by violence and houses and take them away so they oppress a man and his house even a man and his heritage therefore thus says the lord behold against this family do i devise an evil from which ye shall not remove your necks neither shall ye go haughtily for this time is evil God will deliver us. Point number two now. The power and the pool of lusts in temptation. We're coming to James chapter 1. James chapter 1. And we're reading from verse 14. James chapter 1. Reading from verse 14. We're told here, verse 14... But every man, every man, every man is tempted. You know, some people say, I was very pure and very innocent before I came to this community. This community now has defiled me. No, not at all. Every man is tempted. How? You find it in that verse. Some people say, I almost cursed the day I met Mr. So-and-so. Because Mr. So-and-so has so influenced me now, I cannot think of anything else except this negative thing. Uh-uh, it's not Mr. So-and-so. Other people have been confronted by that Mr. So-and-so. And they didn't yield. It's something that was inside you. You didn't know it was inside you. The test came. The temptation came to reveal what was inside you. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away not everybody is drawn away by what interests another man not everybody is conquered by what conquers that other man but this man by himself is conquered because he is drawn away of his own lust peculiar to him and he is enticed then when lost as conceived, it bringeth forth sin. Do you understand? When there is conception, you have to care for that conception to retain the conception. You have to watch over that conception to make sure that the conception remains. It's not everybody that conceives that eventually gives birth. You know why? Some people conceive and they don't care about the conception. They don't even want the conception. And they don't care for the conception. They don't nurse the conception. They do not go to the places where they will help them to allow the conception to develop. A person that has lost on the inside. And then there's an image that comes to him. And there's a perception that that thing must come. That thing must be done. If that temptation comes and you do not nurse that temptation, you do not think about that temptation, you do not protect that temptation, you do not develop that temptation, you do not look forward to the time of committing the sin. You say, no, I'm going to starve it to death. You know, 
no matter how terrible, how powerful, how wild a lion may be, a lion comes into your cage. And you don't have the strength to kill that lion, but you lock it up there. You stab that lion. You lock that gate against the lion. You're not going to nurse it. You're not going to take the picture of that lion. You hate that lion and you keep it there. I don't have power to kill you, but I have the power to stab you. You will stab that lion to death. But when you're feeding the lion, taking care of the lion, the lion one day will grow old enough, powerful enough to jump on you and tear you to pieces. Stab the lion. Stab that temptation. Don't give it food. Don't give it nutrient. Don't give it attention. Don't give it any care at all. Because when lost as conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. But it is the lost that gets that done. I'm looking at Proverbs chapter 6, verse 25. Proverbs chapter 6, verse 25. Lost not after her beauty in thine heart. It's a problem of the heart. A problem of the heart. We all see the same person that you see. We all look at the same person you're looking at. Because we're in the public and we're walking everywhere. We cannot close our eyes while walking. You take public transport. Many other people take public transport too. And in the public transport, you see the ladies, you see the men. In the papers, we see the ladies, we see the men. And then in our communities, we see the ladies and we see the men. But you understand? We see, but we're not thinking about it. We see, and we're not thinking about them. We just see because they're human beings and there's nothing to eat. You don't even know the name, and you're not asking of the name. You don't know their background, you're not asking of the background. You don't think of any association with them. You see, but you see other people also see. And they keep on seeing, and they keep on looking, and they keep on thinking, and they keep on daydreaming. It is that that causes the problem. That's why it's seen in chapter 6, verse 25. Lost not after her beauty in thine heart, neither let her take thee with her eyelids. If you're looking at somebody, the person knows you're looking at him. The person knows you're looking at her. Look up here. You know, it, it, there is uh, something mysterious about human beings. Something mysterious. Why do I say that? Somebody is in front of you. And she doesn't have eyes behind her. And here you are at the back. And you're looking at her and gazing at her from the back. She doesn't have a mirror to reflect that you're looking at her. But surprisingly, she looks back. It's like somebody wants to catch my attention. You understand what I mean? Answer me now. Sometimes you've done that yourself before. Somebody is looking at you, looking at you, looking at you. And it's not that you knew, really. But with reflex action. Without even thinking of anything, you look back and you catch the person who's been looking at you. What does he have in mind? That's why it says, let her not catch you with her eyelids. If you're not looking at her, if you're not gazing at her, if you're not interested in her, if something inside of the lost is not seen, maybe a friendship can develop out of this. Acquaintance can develop out of this. Interest can develop out of this. If you don't think like that, they'll never catch you. They will not catch you. Okay, myself now, they will not catch me. 
verse 26 for by the means of a warish woman a man is brought to a piece of bread a man is brought to a piece of bread and the adulteress will hunt for the precious life there are two things to look at either you keep on looking at the warish woman or you keep on looking at the piece of bread at the end if i allow the eyelids of this person to catch me that's what i'm going to become i'm going to become a worthless lifeless piece of bread i will lose my ministry i will lose my christian experience i will lose my life you're looking at the worthless piece of bread if I allow the eyelashes to catch me, I'm going to lose my dignity. If I allow the eyelashes to catch me, I'm going to lose my friends. My friends are going to say, what? So and so, you were degraded to this level. If I allow the eyelids to catch me, I'm looking at the end of the story. I'm going to be like a lifeless piece of bread that will protect you. I said that will protect you. Looks like um, tonight there's not an excited amen. amen. The Lord will protect you. Amen. The Lord will preserve your life. Amen. You will not be like a piece of bread. Your life is precious. That's what it says in that verse 26. It says, the adulteress will hunt. If you understand that word, you just understand, that's a hunter. That's a hunter. Hunters do not hunt for nothing. They don't have something. You know? They see that in you, and they're hunting for that thing. And they want that thing. And if you don't understand, that is a hunter and he wants to hunt your precious life he wants to hunt your precious title he wants to hunt your precious privilege if you don't understand that hunters will catch the precious life but you are not the one they will catch verse 27 can a man take fire in his bosom and is closed not be burnt can one go upon hot coals and his feet not be burnt so is he that goeth in to his neighbor's wife senseless thoughtless mindless not thinking of hell not thinking of heaven he doesn't think about his precious life. He doesn't know that he's worth anything. And then he has been hunted. The hunter has caught him. Whosoever touches her shall not be innocent. God will preserve your innocency. Mark chapter 4. Reading from verse 18. Mark chapter 4 i'm reading from verse 18 in verse 18 here is what it says and these are they which are sown among thorns such as hear the word and the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches and the lusts for other things entering in choke the word and it becometh unfruitful. You see, there are people that hear the word of God, they reach the word of God. In the morning they wake up, they must reach their Bible. Bible before breakfast. In the night before they sleep, they must read their Bible. No scripture no sleep but the point is between the commencement of the day and the consummation of the day in between you have 
the desire, the lust for all the things entering in that were not there before. You see, it's not just coming to Sunday service. Between the Sunday message and the next Sunday message, lost desires that were not there before entering in will choke the world. It is not just that I never miss the Monday Bible study. I hear the Bible study. I write notes at the Bible study. Next Monday, I'm coming to you. That's good. But you know, between this Monday and next Monday, desires for other things entering in that were not there before. It is what enters in, in between the two points of hearing the word that choke the word and make the word unfruitful and makes the word not to be profitable at all. Look at that verse 19 again. And the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches and the lusts of all that things entering in choke the word and it becometh unfruitful. How can somebody hear about holiness? Last message and the following message and it's not holy. There's something choking the world. How can somebody hear about heaven? The other message and the following message and yet it's not thinking of heaven when it's in the boss. It's not thinking of heaven when it's in the office. It's not thinking of heaven when it's with its neighbor. It's not thinking of heaven when the temptation to fight and the temptation to be unholy, ungodly, when that temptation comes, something is choking the world. It's the lost from the heart. And I pray in your heart, the world will not be choked. Look at First Timothy chapter 6. 1 Timothy chapter 6, I'm reading from verse 9. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 9. But they that will be rich, what? There are many people that don't count that as temptation. Prosperity, they don't count it as temptation. Success, they don't count that as temptation. And they will do anything. They will sacrifice Bible study for prosperity, they will sacrifice their integrity for prosperity, they will sacrifice their Christian experiences or their Christian stand because the desire, the lust to be rich is very strong, very strong. And when any dubious business or any fraudulence knocks at their door, they don't know to lock the door. They say, I've been waiting for that. I must be rich. I must be rich. If I become a millionaire, you see too much? Maybe it's too much for you because you don't know how you are going to keep your life, how you are going to keep your experience, how you are going to keep your conviction with all those things. It says, but they that will be rich, that say, by all means, whatever happens, however it happens whatever all these other people are doing and whatever i will need to do i must be rich but they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and hurtful lusts 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 which drown men in destruction and perdition for the love of money dreaming about it, the love of money, desiring it, the love of money, loving money above the services in the house of God, loving money above the work of God in the ministry, loving money above your own health, you're dying. Even though the man is dying, I have appointment, I have appointment, I have appointment, the man is going. And even if he gets the money, he's not going to live to spend the money. I must have the money for the love of money. Loving money above God. Loving money above the simplicity of the Christian faith. The love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after like Achan, 
which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. But thou, O man of God, pastor, but thou, O man of God, minister, but thou, O man of God, a preacher of the word of God, flee. You see, there are people who are preachers, and they say, you know, I used to believe that just serve the Lord, just sacrifice, and just lay everything upon the altar, and give this costly ministry a chance to bloom in your hand. But now I realize I have been foolish. Other people, they are serving God too, and they are having money. They're serving God too, and they're rich, they're riding this, they're riding this, and they're riding that. And now the temptation comes to them. And now they say, I must be rich also. It says, man of God, that mindset of looking, of desiring, of running after, of doing whatever you are doing so you can have money by all means. Thou man of God, flee these things and follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, and meekness. God will give us wisdom. God will prosper every one of us appropriately without covetousness in Jesus' name. Uh, look at First Peter chapter 2, verse 11. First Peter chapter 2, verse 11. It says, Dearly beloved, I beseech you, I'm pleading with you, as strangers and pilgrims, abstain. That's the command. Abstain. That's in your hand. I can't make you do it. I can't follow you all through the streets of the city. I can't follow you to the people you contact. I can't follow you anywhere. And the people of God cannot follow you everywhere. You are the one to understand. You are saved so you can get to heaven. And if this thing of the world will take you from heaven and take away heaven from you, you are the one that that is a strange thing the devil wants to use to pull me away from heaven. You are the one to abstain. You will abstain. Abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul. They will not conquer you. I'm coming to point number three now. The pursuit and preservation of our treasure despite temptations. The pursuit and the preservation of our treasure. You see, the problem is that some people don't know they have a treasure. Heaven, that's treasure. Reward in heaven, that's treasure. The privilege to be called a minister of the gospel, that's a treasure. The service that God has called us into, not many nobles, not many mighty are called, but he has called the best things of the world to confound them that are mighty in the world. Such a great privilege, what a treasure. The opportunity to mix up and to come with the children of God on a Tuesday like this, with leaders of Deep Alive Bible Church, and to be counted as one of them. What a great treasure. The knowledge of the Word of God that he reveals to us every time what kings have not heard, what prophets have not heard, and they have been searching, but God has given it to us freely like this and fully. What a treasure. And the very fact that our names are written in the book of life in heaven, what a treasure. And if we know what our treasure is, and we know how valuable our treasure is, we know how sublime, how great our treasure is, and then we look at temptation. It's like a penny. It's like cobble. And this one is more than a million naira. 
And this uh, covenant wants to draw our attention. Say, no way, no way. I'm looking at my treasure. Matthew chapter 6. And I'm reading from verse 19. Matthew chapter 6. Reading from verse 19. Lay not for yourselves treasures upon the earth. Where moss and rust doth corrupt. Where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. Treasures in heaven. Treasures in heaven. Look up here for a moment. You know, as you're preaching the gospel, as you're serving the Lord, the Lord is recording something great against your name in heaven. You didn't hear that one. And when you get to heaven, are you going there? When you get to heaven, I said, are you going there? Treasures will be waiting for you. And as you look at those treasures that are waiting for you, and your mind is there, and your heart is there, and your desires are there, and you are thinking about it every time, whatever other things now come by the side to take your mind away from the treasure say, that's the devil this treasure i'm going to get it on the final day you'll get it in jesus name that's why it says lay up your treasures in heaven where neither moss nor rust doth corrupt for where and where thieves do not break through and steal for where your treasure is, tell me, there will your heart be also. You remember one young man, his name, Joseph. He had a dream. All the brothers in the family, everyone in the family was going to bow down to him. He could see ahead the throne. He could see ahead the exalted position and his mind was there all the time and he was pursuing that. They sold him to slavery. He said, no problem, I have a treasure. He was going to preserve that treasure and then the wife of Potiphar came and said, come on, you're a young person. I give this to you for free. You're not the one putting pressure on me. I'm the one saying, you can have this. And that young man said, I have a treasure I must not lose. Because he was looking at his treasure. That's why he couldn't yield to that woman. You see, when we yield to temptation, it's because we forgot our treasure. And then we collapsed. And then we compromised. And then we fell into corruption. You remember Moses? Moses saw the opportunity he was going to have. And his name was going to be on record. That he took a whole nation out of captivity, taking them to the promised land. And when Pharaoh said, how many of you are going? And he said, our men, our women, our children, and our animals, everyone, everything... And then Pharaoh said, now let's strike a bargain. That is the temptation. Go with your men. Go with your women. And go with your children. Leave all the animals behind. It was something to bring them back. And so Moses said, not a hoof are we going to leave behind. You see, he was looking at his treasure. If you know you have a treasure, and you're looking at that treasure, you'll be living and seeing the invisible. Nehemiah was another man. He came to build the walls of Jerusalem that were broken down. And then they told him, come. It was a temptation to be afraid. A temptation to go away from the assignment the Lord had given him. Come away. They're seeking for your life. They're going to kill you. And the man says, you such a man as I flee. Who is there? Like a man like me that will flee from the enemy. He said, because I perceived that so and so had sent them. 
His eyes were on his treasure. If you have treasure, something precious, and your eyes are looking at the pressure every time, nothing will make you to bend to the devil. You will not bend. Here is Job. And the wife said, are you still holding on to your integrity? Because God and I. But you know, Job, he was looking at the future. I know that my Redeemer liveth. And even though this my skin be totally destroyed and totally devastated by worms, I know I shall see my Redeemer with my own eyes when I see him and not another. He was looking to that faraway treasure. And because of that, he said, woman, how do you speak like this, like a foolish woman? Shall we receive something good from the hand of the Lord and not receive something, uh, something evil? And so he sinned not with his mouth. You must have a treasure. There must be something that catches your attention. That was saying, I'm looking at this, I'm looking at that. And because of all that, all these things, they call temptation, will not have any hold upon your life, will not hold you down in Jesus' name. Daniel had a treasure. Daniel was to be the prophet, the mouthpiece of God. He was to have revelation that God will give him from that time until the end of time. He was to see the revelation of the Son of Man, the Son of God. And because of that, although there were temptations in uh, Babylon, but Daniel made up his mind and he said, I will not defile myself with the portion of the king's meat. He was looking at his treasure because he knew they that turn many to righteousness shall shine as stars forever and ever. The apostles had treasure and they were looking at their treasure when they were threatened by those Pharisees. Did it will tell you not to preach in this name? Look at what you have done. You fill Jerusalem with your doctrine. And you intend to bring this man's blood upon us. And then Peter and the rest of the apostles answered and said, We we'll rather obey God than men. Whether I try to obey you or to obey God, look into that. But as for us, we're going to obey the Lord. They were looking at their treasure. You know what Jesus had told them? You who have continued with me in this adulterous generation, you will come into the kingdom. You will reign over the 12 tribes of Israel. And because of that promise and because of that treasure, I go to prepare a place for you. And when I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself so that where I am, there ye may be also treasure. Look at your treasure. You remember Paul the Apostle? Paul the Apostle, when the prophecy came, this is what's going to happen to this man when he gets to Jerusalem. And the people were weeping and they were saying, Paul, you won't go to Jerusalem with you. Please don't go. Please don't go. And he said, what do you mean? To break my heart? What you're weeping? I'm not only ready to go there and suffer. I'm ready to go there and die at Jerusalem. He had a treasure he was looking at. That's why he said at the end of his pilgrimage here, I fought a good fight. And I have kept the faith. And it says now, there is laid up for me a crown, a crown of righteousness, a crown of life that is waiting for me, which the Lord will give me at that day. And not to me only, but to all them that love is appearing. You must have a treasure you're looking at. Otherwise, temptation will get the better of you. I pray your treasure will not be taken away from you. Matthew chapter 13. I'm reading from verse 44. Matthew chapter 13, verse 44. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto treasure hid in a field, which the which when a man has found, he hideth, and for the joy thereof, 
goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. A treasure so precious, a treasure so important that you set your mind on and you give up every other contesting thing, every other thing that tries to contest that treasure. Mark chapter 10. And I'm reading from verse 21. Mark chapter 10, verse 21. Then Jesus beholding him said unto him, One thing thou lackest, go thy way, sell whatsoever thou hast, and give to the poor, and thou shalt have, tell me, treasure in heaven, and come, take up thy cross, and follow me. It says, money became the idol of this man, young man, rich children. And Jesus said, sever yourself. Separate yourself. Detach yourself from the idol of money. Sell what you have. Give to the poor. Come, follow after me. You will have treasure in heaven. And he was such at that saying. And when you we grieved, for he had great possessions that had become an idol. And that was a great temptation for him. And Jesus looked around, the, around about and said to his disciples, How hardly shall they that have riches enter into the kingdom of God? When those possessions, material things, tangible things, when they change your consecration, when you change your commitment, when they change your devotion to the great commission, and now, possession, possession, possession. Not that you're even looking for them. They're already there. And they tie you down. And they pin you down. How hardly shall they that have such possessions tying them down enter into the kingdom of God? And the disciples were astonished at his words. But Jesus answers again. And says unto them, children, how hard is it for them that trust in riches. They think their joy is going to come from that possession. Their joy is going to come from those riches. And because of that, they relegate God and God's work to the background. How hard is it? For them that trust in riches to enter into the kingdom of God, you will not lose your treasure. You protect that treasure. The privilege of serving the Lord, you'll protect in Jesus' name. First Corinthians chapter 9. In First Corinthians chapter 9, I'm reading from verse 25. First Corinthians chapter 9. Verse 25, it tells us in verse 25, it says, And every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things, moderate in all things, in his enjoyment of the things of this world, moderate, temperate in all things, in seeking, searching, running after, the things of this life is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. I therefore so run, not as uncertainly, so fight I, not as one that beateth the air, but I keep my body under. I keep my tastes under. I keep my desires under. I keep my wants under. I keep my excitement under control. I keep under my body and bring it into subjection. Lest that by any means, when I preach to others, I myself shall be a cast away. 
you will not be a castaway. I said you will not be a castaway. You are moderate in all things. Good things come for you to enjoy. You are moderate. You are not overpowered by that good thing. It can become a temptation. Bad experiences come that bring sorrow. You are moderate in your sorrow. You are moderate in your response to that sorrow. You are not overwhelmed by that sorrowful theme. First Corinthians chapter 7. Don't allow good things to become a temptation. Bad things to become a temptation. Keep your desires and keep your joy under control. First Corinthians chapter 7 verse 29. But this I say, brethren, the time is short. It remaineth that both they that have wives be as though they had none. You know, there are people, I'm married, I'm married. Praise God, you are married. Not only you, the rest of us were married too. Why were you not at the workers' meeting? Didn't you hear? I just got married. We heard. We didn't know that marriage will take you away from the work of God. Why were you, you not at the Sunday service uh, last time? Sir, it was the previous day, Saturday, I got married. And I just thought, I need to, you know, give vacation to worship. And allow worship to remain where it is. And, you know, you know sir, uh, we young people, we like to have honeymoon. And they, therefore, I stayed away. And actually, it's not only one week we're staying away. We're even traveling to where it is now, Germany, America, Canada, whatever. We're going to do one more honeymoon there. Good luck to you. You forsake the work of God because of, uh, because of honeymoon, because of, you know, you got married. You got married. If the rest of us had done that, the work of God will not have progressed. Look at verse 29. But this I say, don't allow marriage to become temptation. Don't allow enjoyment to become a temptation. Don't allow all the things the people are running after in the world. They're going to Dubai to have their honeymoon, to have their wedding. I hope you're not like that. It says, but this I say, brethren, the time is short. It remaineth that both they that have wives be as though they had none. And they that weep as though they wept not. And they that rejoice as though they rejoice not. And they that buy as though they possess not. And they that use this world as not abusing it for the fashion of this world passeth away. The fashion of this world passes away. Care for the things of the Lord and let this be your treasure. And the Lord will reward you on the final day in Jesus' name. Revelation chapter 2, I'm reading from verse 10. Revelation chapter 2, I'm reading from verse 10. In this verse, here the Lord Jesus Christ is speaking to every one of us. And he says, fear not of those things which thou shalt suffer. Don't make a suffering you know, to become such a big deal. You know, I'm suffering persecution. The people of the world are suffering more than any of us are suffering. They suffer calamity. They suffer disaster. They suffer barrenness, they suffer joblessness, they suffer quite a lot. There are graduates in the world that are pushing cards to make ends meet. Don't make a big deal out of that. I don't have this, I don't have this, I don't have that. We're praying you will have them, but don't let the pursuit of those things become a temptation. Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison, that they may be tried, and you shall have tribulation, trial, testing, ten days, but be thou faithful unto them. I will be faithful. I said, I will be faithful, and I will give you a crown of life, a crown of life. You know, sometimes after we finish, um, you know, Tuesday meeting like this or any other kind of meeting, and then we're going back home, there are times I've been held up in the holder. There was a time we got back home, 
around after 11 in the night. After finishing the Tuesday meeting or the Monday Bible study in the various locations and where we were going, sometimes we finish 8.30 or to 9 after the prayers and then we're going back home. There was a particular day where we were on the road until some minutes to 12. And what about that? But there are other motorists also that didn't go for Bible study. Other people too that were not at any leadership meeting. They were coming from wherever they were coming from. And they were in the same hold up. That's not a big deal. If they could do that in the world, what are we talking about? How is it we're allowing the condition in our city to become a temptation to us? I will not allow it in my life. I will not allow it in my life. It says, be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. A crown is waiting for you. Am I talking to somebody there today? I rejoice with you. Great treasures in heaven for you. I say great treasures in heaven for you. Revelation chapter 3 verse 11. Revelation chapter 3 verse 11. Behold, I come quickly. Hold that fast which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. Nobody will take your crown. I said, nobody will take your crown. Him that overcometh, will I make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go no more out, and I will write upon him the name of my God, and the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven from my God, and I will write upon him my new name. I, was, I thought that is talking about you. I said it's talking about you. You have an, a treasure in heaven. You will not miss it in Jesus' name. Verse 21, verse 21, to him that overcometh, will I grant to sit in my throne. Uh, he that overcometh, will I grind to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and am set down with my father in his throne. He that has ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches. I have heard. I have heard. I will preserve my treasure. I will protect my treasure. Temptation will not shift you away from your post of duty in Jesus' name. In 1 Peter chapter 1, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled that faded not away, reserved in heaven for you reserved in heaven for me who are kept by the power of god through faith unto salvation ready to be revealed in the last time your treasure is about to be revealed your glory is about to be revealed your honor is about to be revealed let that temptation become nothing let that temptation become like a piece of paper, worthless, that you throw away. And your treasure, something of value, and something that has great worth. And you are watching over that treasure. And any temptation, whatever temptation, will not grab your soul. I will not pull you down in Jesus' name. I will stand. I will stand. I will stand. Temptation will not have any hold upon your life in Jesus' name. Rise up and tell the Lord. Rise up and tell the Lord, I'm an overcomer. I am more than a conqueror. You're going to overcome and you're going to conquer 
don't allow any temptation to any sin, any material sin. Temptation to the gold of the earth, temptation to the silver of the world, temptation to the material things of the world, temptation to the women, to the men of the world, temptation to material things in the world. Don't allow any temptation to bog you down, to hold you down, to drag you back. Stand for the Lord and stand for righteousness. Your reward is waiting for you in heaven.